Thank you very much, Susa, for this uh, short introduction to Connecting Cities. So I also want to um, welcome you to the Connecting Cities conference today. I'm the moderator, I'm Claudia Schnuck, and I am happy to introduce uh, Connecting Cities to the post-city uh, Ars Electronica Festival. So uh, in Connecting Cities, we've experienced uh, many different cities and, and people from different backgrounds working together on interesting topics uh, that are about the city, about city development, about how we can use uh, the, the means and the uh, creative means and the different media we have in cities and we have with new technologies to work together and to develop something together. And uh, the post-city conference is very much also about um, thinking about new uh, ways to approach cities and city developments. So uh, the post-city kit, um, something that's uh, a red thread throughout the whole conference, uh, or the whole, um, not only the conference here now, but also uh, the Connecting Cities uh, Conference, Symposium, and the Ars Electronica Festival is shown in the exhibition, but also means um, something like uh, showing, providing tools, infrastructures, um, prototypes or visions for future cities. So we try to think together about future cities and how we can um, create future cities and how we can create future city structures through thinking uh, from different perspectives with uh, different, with our different background from our, um, from, from fields uh, you normally would not expect to work together. So uh, this is why now um, uh, or the next step is a keynote on connected intelligence. So the next uh, talk you will hear about uh, connective intelligence is by Dirk de Kerkhove. Uh, he is the he formally directed the McLuhan program uh, in Toronto. He is the scientific advisor of the Association Osservatorio Tutti Media. He is the scientific director of the digital culture magazine Media Duemila. He is the research supervisor of the planetary collegium Tino in, uh, in Trento. And along uh, with uh, Pia Rossignol, uh, he is the co creator of the Atelier for Connective Intelligence. So, Let's welcome Dirk de Kerkhove. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to be invited and very honored also of the responsibility of being the first speaker of this. Uh... My contribution to Connected Cities actually goes back a few years. It was called the Global Village Square. It never was realized, and I'm glad it wasn't because now I see that it's been very much superated by the lovely film that Susa Pop has actually presented to us. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is really post-city much more than connected intelligence uh, because, uh, well, because I've talked a lot about connected intelligence in the past. I'll explain anyway what it's all about. First, a word, a word from my sponsor, Marshall McLuhan, sponsoring ideas. It's an important statement that he made in 1974. The planet and nature were obsolesced by Sputnik October 4th, 1957, and have become art form also. Sputnik saw the birth of ecology and art replacing nature. It's very important because what has happened at that time was a kind of a benchmark for this extraordinary change of art and uh, culture replacing and of course, technology replacing uh, nature. It is now possible to treat the whole environment as an art form. So think about uh, July 94, Dolly, April, April 2003, the human genome. What that means is that eventually, what McLuhan really meant was that if you surround an environment by a technological environment, you make the previous one a content and it becomes programmable. And it's a very big insight because, in fact, what we are looking at in post-city and everything that we are discussing is, in fact, everything being programmable. The planet itself, life, food, and with OGM and other things, and, of course, the city. And, in fact, the programmable city is just as good a name uh, as post-city to, to describe what's happening. What did McLuhan think about post-city? Metropolitan, he didn't know the term, but... Metropolitan space is equally irrelevant for the telephone, the telegraph, the radio, and television. 
He didn't talk about the internet. He died before that. What the town planners call the human scale in discussing ideal urban spaces is equally unrelated to these electric forms. Our electric extensions of ourselves simply bypass space and time and create problems of human involvement and organization for which there is no precedent. I like very much also Rosanna Araujo. She's a member of the team that is working on the uh, Post City project, a uh, Brazilian architect. And she wrote this book called The City Is Me, which sounded a bit like L'État c'est moi by Louis XIV in France. But in fact, she explains, once connected to the external world, these devices extend our nervous system to the endless connection of the network. And once we break the limit of our skin, we are also connected to the architecture, which means that some of these electronic organs can be built into our surrounding environment. So what is occupying the city? We live in three spaces. We live in the physical space, this one. We live, of course, in the mental space, which is more or less what's happening in there. And we live in this intermediate world, which is between the physical and the mental. It's an intermediate situation between matter and consciousness, and it establishes a continuity between the real and the virtual where defined boundaries vanish. Our basic sensorial apparatus is changing proportion and reach in telepresence and virtualization. Salvatore Iaconesi will be presenting a lot of things during this week. Uh, he's very much a star in the Italian art scene, and I like his style. And the way he expresses this is absolutely superb. And in fact, he's both saying what's happening now, but what's coming. We find ourselves in a, third, a, a, a digital third space, more inclusive, in which information is not only attached to places, spaces, bodies, and objects, but constantly recombines remixes, recontextualizes, creating constantly new geographies which are emotional, linguistic, semantic, relational, or relative to the many patterns which non-human algorithms can glimpse in ways in which layers emerge from data, information, and knowledge correlating different spaces, time, and human networks. I like that quote because it actually talks about, it actually makes alive that interval of space that we occupy between, uh, between ourselves and, and, and our cities, and also just sitting on a bench, you know, sitting on a chair. Uh, we, are in, we are surrounded by an aura of information that we can actually grab, but it's also aura of information about us that anybody can grab. So what, how do I see Post City? Well, I think Post City is about smart city with people. But I have to, I have to add people because uh, most of the conferences and talks that I've attended on smart cities usually don't ignore them, but don't emphasize them either, and really talk about technology. We have to remember that smart city is a buzzword, and it's a buzzword like big data, uh, like Internet of Things, like cloud computing, which are really uh, guiding industries, uh, guiding markets, guiding things and eventually have a human meaning as well, because eventually they invade our lives. But the fact is, uh, the people are what's important. People without limits or time or space, but, and this is, this is where I think post city is important, it's important to notice that, that it's local above the global. You have to live somewhere, your body is somewhere, right? So it's actually the local is more important than glo the global. Partly, if not mostly automated, but it puts community in above technology. I think we will hear a lot about community. Connecting intelligence, but not forgetting emotion. So what are, what's our job? Well, we have to find community involvement strategies. That's the group of connected intelligence worship, one, the first group. Then we have to understand publicity. Publicity is a, is a term invented by Mark Federman, who is part of this group. And it, it's a, he has changed definition of publicity several times, and he will probably explain it. But it's generally what it is, how do you sort out the new condition of being a private person or maybe not, and being very much a public person whether you like it or not, what is this new contraction of our sense of ourselves, our identity, and the sense people have uh, of us. So uh, that's publicity, and then of course we'll also seek smart democracy, that's still a big dream. Uh, democracy, you have to remember, was invented by the Greeks, after the invention of the phonetic alphabet, it allowed everybody to have a 
representation, at least not everybody, not the slaves, but the people were in, capable of voting. And that came from the fact that people were becoming individuals as opposed to be members of tribes. Democracy was the dream of giving power to the people. It has been semi-realized in some circumstances, and it seems that there's a big dream about you know, using the media to actually improve it, and maybe if we use the media very well, we can, but that's exactly what we are out to discover. We have two tools. Uh, I'll show you a bit of ThinkWire uh, a little later, and those Connected Intelligence Workshop, which I'll be uh, working on with my team uh, this afternoon and a couple of days later. What's interesting about big data, the buzzword, you know, it's that it's a kind of an X-ray of a city. It's an X-ray of, of a city's experience, an X-ray of a community, meaning it literally probes into the various div dimension of our involvement with cities to arrive at some conclusions, some quantitative conclusions, and to act upon, upon these sort of things. So you have things like integrated city sensing, and there's a lot of tools developed now. You have also this, what I call the urban unconscious, which is the enormous quantity of unrelated or eventually correlated data that we are not aware of that uh, actually condition more and more of our experience. Emotional cartographies, it's now possible. I'll show you an example which I love. Uh, it's possible now to really suss out how people feel about any kind of situation. Local media survey, community monitoring, relationship survey. Hmm, remember Ashley Madison? Um, what to find and what to avoid. Example, many of you have seen these maps of crime zones in cities where not to go in order to avoid uh, trouble. Uh, this is Philadelphia and all the zone in red with numbers tell you how many murders have happened in the last week or the last month uh, or how many theft and so on. These are just standard uh, tools now available for uh, people to uh, manage their, manage their uh, per traveling in a city. Another you know, 100,001 tools because apps are being developed all the time. Kids in my classes develop apps. Uh, and of course, big data is going to be an extraordinary resource for developing specific apps, knowing exactly. Think about four, uh, you know, four square multiplied by a thousand. Personalized routing for multitude in smart cities, guidance to better touristic venues, evaluating residential occasional pattern internationally to enhance life that's connecting cities to find out what they do elsewhere and how can you import and how can you do trans uh, technology transfer or innovation transfer. I will show you an example of visualizing air pollution and uh, using Twitter and call data to analyze, oh yes, analyze urban happiness, misery loves company. This is my favorite example of big data. Have you, anybody saw this one? It's an adorable example. It uh, happened in 2012 between, uh, uh, it was uh, finding out what Twitter was saying uh, about New Year's resolution, you know, Americans make New Year's resolution at the end of the year. Next year, I'll be stronger, I'll be nicer, I'll be richer. Well, I'll be richer is in green, I'll be nicer is in pink, and I'll be stronger and better and healthier is in blue. Well, you know, you may, <laughs> you may decide to emigrate to this, you know, the, the, the redder zone, because you'll find more friendly people or so on. But I think this is such a sweet, you know, innovation that I think you don't need to have many more examples to know what big data can do. But another aspect I think that's important to keep in mind is that social media are actually acting in our cities and in our communities as a limbic system. As you know, the limbic system is what conditions your emotions and how your emotions are uh, processed in your body and the emotion is a survival technology because if you have a strong emotion you are act you will actually act on it emotion and eventually this is now being transferred by the kind of emotional content that is developed on or judgments or statements or expressions of how you feel on on social media it's in constant acceleration in growth and complexity Think about the extraordinary and unrelenting evolution 
from the time of the telegraph to the Internet of Things and big data. Every step giving you more bandwidth, giving you more uh, connections, giving you more complexity, and giving you more imagination of how to develop the next step. The other thing is that because of this emotional content, people want to be involved. They actually do. I mean, there was a long time when you had the so-called silent majority, but the majority is not silent anymore. It wants to get into the act. Well, maybe not the majority, but a lot more people than before want to get into the act. What is the most common thing for us as individuals to do when we have a strong emotion is to share it. The first thing we want to do is to tell somebody, unless you are very much you know, closed in yourself, but you want to just share it. And social media do that. They allow you to share, to share your emotion, and they support that need to, to, to share it. Local is as important, as I said before, as global, and we have to consider that uh, in order to make it work, you have to have face-to-face -face as well as the online. In touch constantly by the effect, effects of electricity, putting people in touch with each other. I found it very interesting, this long-term research, a 20 years research on how emotions go viral. This is, a, a this is the example of the green spots, a dynamic spread of happiness in large social networks. And it's over 20 years of analysis, they've done several examples, how, and I, I think this is really important, that uh, how if you bring good news on the social network, how it actually extends it to other people. Not for everybody in the same way. For example, uh, you have an, uh, uh, here an example of how important the type of relationship is. So if you are nearby, if you're talking about a nearby mutual friend, that's the highest. If it's a nearby friend, it's pretty high. Again, um, a distant uh, a next door neighbor is higher than a same block neighbor. So they have done this very scientifically just to find out exactly how you can eventually sort of distribute an emotional effect on, uh, on social media. So this is my first tool provided by artists. I will use a few artists. Uh, it's a thing that has been featured here at Ars Electronica in 2005. It's called emotional traffic. And I like it very much for its simplicity and for another reason, which I'll explain. What it is, is you go online and you pick up out of 20 different kind of emotions, uh, five. And then you click on that, and then you see a map of the world which shows you, according to 3,000 um, Google Trends analysis, the words that correspond or the situation that correspond to the emotions that you have selected. So you get this map of hopeful, grateful, scared. There's all these different kinds of emotion which give you a map. All right, so I was talking about this with Maurice Benayoun, who is the creator, and I was telling him, you know, it's like, you know, uh, this is like really amazing. Can you, can you, oh, he said, it's not at all scientific. It doesn't represent anything real. What it does, it does, it does get a quantitative analysis of the various Google trends in the various cities, but you can't count on it to actually make a decision about what kind of major emotion is happening because. But what I like about it is this. It is obviously metaphorical. Art is metaphorical. Art allows people to connect with the effect of a technology. That is media art. But it's also based on an actual source of information that is as objective as you can make it. Even if that is a tiny nudge towards the metaphor, it's and, and Maurice specializes in not doing it only metaphorical, but connecting it with some kind of data that comes together uh, to make the point. All right, so that was about emotions. Now uh, it's about uh, intelligence. What is connected intelligence? Well, it is not collective intelligence. Okay, we've got the old fight with Pierre Lévy on this matter. I don't want to go back there, but... Collective intelligence is, for me, what is the result of television. It's basically something that's not articulated in a specific way, and it doesn't deal with individual people. Connected intelligence does actually point to different people in different configurations that are very specific. And one of the nicest configurations of specific connections is the one that was created by Gary Schwartz and 
co-created by myself because we've been at it for 30 years and for 30 years we've been fascinated, me as a professor, in collaboration. I always think that as a teacher, if you just have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the student or a broadcasting relationship, which is a broadcasting relationship with you guys, uh, a broadcasting relationship, it's not as effective as you get the students to work together. But to do that, there's two things. One, you have to find the right tool, the right situation, the right format for them to do that. The other one is you have to be able to also evaluate their collaboration because otherwise you just don't know where you're going. Thinkwire is extremely intelligent. It set up a, pa a panel. What it is, it's basically putting panels together to discuss an issue. It gives you, um, it gives you 280 characters. For those who are frustrated with 140, it allows you to actually develop an argument. But, and that's the key, it doesn't give you enough time to ramble and to do blah blah. You can actually, you have to focus. Now you see, this is a treatment of intelligence. It's a specific way of dealing with an aim of how you get people to collaborate. And I can tell you, and I'll show you a bunch of examples, we did use Thinkwire for uh, the last two months in order to prepare for the meetings we are going to have with, with the Connected Intelligence Atelier. And uh, we have received some very good content, and I will give you some, some example. But I, again, I find it's a very uh, perf perfect example of what I mean by Connected Intelligence. And Connected Intelligence, you know, it, it starts with email, goes on with the social media, deals with various kind of strategies, but fundamentally, it's carving into data sphere the right connection for the specific purpose that you want to actually develop. Um, in fact, if we are connected, we are, I can show you what it looks like, if that comes. <clears throat> eh. It's not happy. Uh-oh. Oh, well. Um, don't know why, but it's not happy. Uh, maybe later I, I can show it. Anyway, you can all go on it. It's, the address is very simple. It's uh, www.thinkwire.com uh, slash arselectronica. Go for it, and you'll enjoy it, and you can see what we have, what we have discussed. This, were, this was the comments on community. So we have three, as I said, we have three ateliers simultaneously, community issues or how to get community involved, uh, publicity and smart democracy. So this is on community. Agnes Yoon from Korea, who is there, has actually made this lovely comment. Community involvement may not be limited in specific vertical projects based on proximity, institutions or sustainable groups. Instead, Dynamic contexts are replacing traditional boundaries and characteristic of belongingness, which makes you think that community formation in urgent matters or immediate requests uh, is a bit like thinking. You basically gather people the way you gather thoughts in order to arrive at the conclusion you're interested in. I like Gary's own uh, wonderful statement. The next challenge is to weave individual data back into a community narrative. Yeah, that also deals with publicity. How do you actually make, you know, people really make sense out of, of, of their uh, community involvement? Rafael Mira from Spain, from director of a group called Collaborative Intelligence, uh, says, digital media bring many opportunities. However, key for the development of a true democracy is the ability to collaborate among ourselves through spaces for deliberation. The digital world allows for the creation, expansion, and large participation on these spaces and platform. But in order to check this out, I went to, and I actually sent this on the, uh, on the uh, Thinkwire panel, this very interesting observation by Georgios Keliotis. What is community online? It's based on shared interests and weak ties. I like this, weak ties. Not necessarily the strong ties. You know, the Granovator famous theory of weak ties that actually get you a job faster than your father or the, your, best, your father's best friend. Weak ties. Yes, it's true. These communities are based on weak ties. You meet somebody once or you don't even meet them. You just connect with them on the internet and you share an idea. And this is why it's so, it's so key. It's egocentric. The theory of mass individual pre presented by Manuel Castells. We're all mass individuals and we are all centered on our own concerns. 
individuals create social network based on their interest and motivation, not tied to a single community. Communities come in many shapes and sizes, but the traditional idea of community is a pastoral myth. That's from my colleague at University of Toronto, Barry Wellman and Gulia. Uh, the idea that you know a community was like a very close knit thing and very sort of no, there are like that, but basically online that's not the way it works. So how is this, how is this or that community seen by its members? Here are several very interesting arguments for and against uh, the online community. Uh, on the left, you see the negs, and the, on, the, on the right side, you see the positive. Uh, I'll just go to a couple. Relationships on the internet are weak, short-lived, and interest-based only. Why is that? But simply because for the same reason that the relationship in our own head may not be weak, but they certainly are short-lived, because in our mind, we put together certain things we need on that score, and then we move on to something else. It is perfectly normal in that sphere to have pointed, punctual, right on time uh, relationships. The positive is the internet helps create and manage many useful weak ties. Uh, on, online involvement antagonizes offline communities. Uh, I'd like to see the proof of that, but anyway, online participation can increase the diversity of ties and can uh, support offline activities. You can check that, it'll be available uh, individually and see where you stand on this, but I think it's a very, very interesting game of comparison. So what about publicity? Publicity is occupying the third space. Mark Federman's, uh, one of his uh, definition, no, that's not one of his definition, but it comes, millennials experience their life in public. Publicity is the sometime intimate sharing of first person living. That's a very dense, con you know, way of describing. Yes, you, it's uh, first person living is what you share online, and at the same time, it can be extremely intimate. And uh, you can know, can't always control that, but most of the millennials don't really care that they are, you know, their intimacy is being probed, which is in itself a very interesting civilizational change. If from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance we saw that European culture were moving from a tribal, family-based, community-oriented to individuals, Right now, we are seeing those individuals which were formed by the alphabet back and reformed by electricity and by all the media we talked about, reformed into a very different kind of combination. Publicity is an important term to describe exactly what kind of psychology is being developed right now in our culture. We're evolving rapidly from the era of opacity, literacy is silent and personalized control of language. See, if you... <laughs> If you're a reader, you don't read aloud. Actually, the Greeks read aloud first. Reading was first an aloud thing. But then silent reading gradually came in. What is silent reading? It's the internalizing of language. It's the control of language, and hence the control of thought. So you become closed to the world. You become closed in. You share with the world what it is that you want to share, but you keep the rest. No? So what's happening with the era of transparency with the new media and the fact that the millennials don't care about what they have to uh, show is the reversal from the printed word to the uh, electronic word, to the screen-based relationship, and it's very transparent. So this is all, we don't know all the consequences of this. Mark, again, we used to control our own privacy, especially private thought. Publicity initially suggested curation of a multiplicity of e-persona. That was his first definition. Now with ubiquitous telemetry via digi footprints and big data collection, what we curate is only a partial story. So that was a change to definition already. <laughs> Admit that. Well, it was it's certainly, uh, it's certainly very astute. So I'm imagining the future of Google Glass. I know Google Glass is not on the top of people's agenda these days, and certainly not of Google either, but they're thinking about doing things. But I'm just imagining what would happen if we had, forget Google Glass, which apparently are not sexy enough, but you'd have vitrionics, which is you have contact lenses, which have a little camera in, embedded in it, and have you know, access to all these sort of things. So you have vitrionics so that you can wear your Google Glass and have access to whatever it is through uh, what's happening on your eyes. Emotive is something that is now common. You can get it for 100 bucks on the, on the internet, and it's a system that allows you to put a, you know, a head-mounted display, a very simple one, 
and taps your brain, and as you use it, you can find that you can relate by thought alone with whatever happens on your screen, and also analyze your emotions and all these sort of things. GPS, you don't know what GPS is, face recognition. Face recognition is now one of the unchallenged, unquestioned happening, you know, I can, we can go down the street and take a picture of somebody and immediately know everything. So it's, it's definitely very much an exposing technology, big data, uh, quantified self. So it's information minus privacy, culture of transparency and omniscience. Again, that's the core of the technological ground from which people are evolving into different persons. Publicity is a reversal of the public and the private. And again, another tool provided by the artist. I'm not connected, so I can't show you, but I adore this. This is by Julia Burns. She's a very important uh, Australian artist, and she did it in 2009, public access. Uh, you can go and find it online. And so th what she did was to sit outside on a day that wasn't that warm, with her heater on the right, uh, and with her big screen showing to everybody her conversation on Facebook. And people would just go by, and then, you know, and then it would continue, and some of them would stop and say, what, what are you doing? And then she would say, well, I'm trying to share my life with the public. And she was, it's, a, it's just a statement by an artist to tell you, hey, guys, you're not private anymore. Just make, you know, make sure you got that. Again, I love artists because they always have a great deal of uh, imagination and fun. So is big data the grand new inquisitor? Hmm? Remember the inquisitor? You remember, when you go from one era to another, like going from the Middle Ages, ruled by the church, into the Renaissance, ruled by the state, and ruled by the powerful, you go through a lot of emotional trouble, ideological trouble, philosophical trouble, and that was the Inquisition. The Inquisition was doing exactly what I was talking about, going into the opacity of the new individual, the new closed-in person, to go by torture to the content of that person's thinking. Well, today, big data doesn't have to torture you. It simply has to examine you. It's less painful, but it could have consequences which are more painful. Here are four, again, I'm, I've been abusing Mark's stuff here, but I thought that his contribution, he was the director of publicity, so that was his job, but he put very good, very good questions. How can we know our multiple identities? How do we make sense of their holographic construction of ourselves? I mean, we're constantly being rebuilt by people who search data on ourselves. So, how can we protect against convenient but commodifying technology that dehumanizes and objectifies us? How do we begin to create a critical pedagogy? This is key too. I'm talking about the Jesuit 2.0. Why the Jesuits and why 2.0? Because the Jesuits, Ignatius de Loyola, in 1536, created the first Western European pedagogical system, vision, that lasts till today. Why is it important to put them together with today? It's because Ignatius of Loyola actually based his pedagogy on the dominant tool of his time. And that was the printed book, which has just appeared. So that from, and of course, he picks up all the legacies of Greece and Rome, to come up with paideia, which was the Greek model of education, and the various forms. But he brought in all the things that, uh, that were necessary in the studio um, Ratio Studiorum, which he then published. The 2.0 aspect is, of course, we need a new order, maybe not with Jesuits, but we need a new order of pedagogy which would be based on the zero one, based on the digital, based on the tool that is the, which is the ground of our, our present exper ex uh, experience. If we met ourselves, I love that one, if we met ourselves in a dark alley, dark cyber alley, would we like or even recognize who we meet? That's what I call the digital unconscious. Everything that's known about you that you don't know. And its importance on your life is just as strong as anything Freud said, because you can actually make votes, you can actually buy things. There are all kinds of experiences that you can have that are actually your, your uh, 
uh, your basic thing. Where you come from, this is a Pico Ayer quoted by Gary Schwartz, where you come from is less important than where you're going. Identity is more rooted in the present than in the past. I like that thought very much because, yes, we always used to judge people by where they had been trained, what family they came from, what they had done before. Actually, the idea now is to predict where you're going, to know what you'll be doing. If you're going to be you know, analyzed for a job, this is where the emphasis is going to be. Yeah, we're very happy you've done a PhD, we, yeah, you've done this job, but basically, what are you doing now? And what does it say about what you'll be doing in the future is now much easier access because of the information environment in which we are. Maybe, as Pico says, we're all a floating tribe, only connected to our present geography based on our digital actions and the impact those actions have on inanimate and inanimate things around us. You know, that's what it is, this kind of aura that I was talking about of information about us and for us. Ashley Madison, you know the story? Hackers got into a encounter uh, site and they actually published uh, the uh, names and uh, addresses of the people who were actually unfaithful to their wives or husbands. Uh, yeah, that's where we're going to see a lot more of that. It's not as if it was terribly, but what the consequence of that also is that being faithful or unfaithful will change parameters, will change this definition. Our whole sex life is always controlled by the media we use. I mean, the kind of extreme uh, Freudian problems of body, sex, and all that that came with literacy is now being overturned by the fact that we are moving away from guilt. We are back in shame. We're moving away from, what is guilt? Guilt is shame internalized. Guilt is shame that is secret. You, nobody knows you've done it, but you do, so you feel guilty. If nobody knows you've done it in a shame culture, nobody cares. You don't care. You're not feeling personally. You've, things, things have been done through you as opposed to you making decisions about doing them. So if somebody knows, you're ashamed. What is the culture of shame today? It's called reputation capital. Ashley Madison is a perfect example of losing one's reputation capital. What's needed here? I call it the new baptism, all tagged at birth, tagged in such a way that we know the baptism was a way of getting into the community of the church. Today, you'll just have a little implant that will actually keep tracking where you are, what you're doing, and prevent you from becoming another terrorist. Under ben permanent, generally benevolent surveillance, the balance between security and liberty is still to be negotiated between the people and their governments. And uh, going to Gary, this is a challenge of the IoT, Internet of Things, where we are all nodes and the community takes instructions from the aggregated data. This is new community, it is also the new democracy. Tools provided by artists. You know, Usman Hake has a freaking flyer points coming to, uh, to Linz. He's an artist that I like very much, uh, architect as well, and uh, years ago he invented this cloak of invisibility. It's like, you know, a Harry Potter kind of thing. It's a jewel that you carry a bit like the ones that you see on Star Trek, and it creates a brouillage, uh, scrambling of all the signals that come around you. So you are actually protected from being, of course, you can call anybody, but nobody can get access to you. Metaphor, again, not real. I mean, it is semi-real. He did create the stuff. What is apparently more real is this thing. Oh, it's pop in my pocket. This is like very innocent. It's a little, little bag, you know, created by Aram Barthol. And this is the way he shows, and you can actually design it yourself. And all you have to do is to open your little bag and put your cell phone in the bag, and the bag does exactly what <laughs> was, it's, it's created in a, in a material that actually scrambles the signal. I love it. That's another really nice tool to protect yourself from, you know, being, being invaded. So, <clears throat> on smart democracy, let's see if I still have a bit of time, yeah, a bit of rush. Um, I believe the idea of smart democracy in 2015 is rooted in the connected citizen. The idea of the citizen as an always ambient beacon allows for social media journalism and accountability locally, nationally, and globally that we never had a decade ago. So, and, and my thought to that is that, you know what? Democracy is representation. 
citizen representation. But in fact, digital media is not so much a representation, it's action. Real-time pressure about discernible and prioritized emergencies, to say nothing about their masking power. In a do-it-yourself culture, you don't need representation. You need paid and accountable government. I mean, government as a service. <laughs> That's a very new thing, but it was the principle of government in the first place. But now we are a service to government, so reverse the proposition. Think government, you pay, you, you know, they have to be a... Hey, as a teacher, I discovered teacher evaluation. It certainly did an effect on the quality of my teaching. Not that I wasn't doing my best, but I did even better my best when I started being evaluated by my students. I think government should be evaluated and they should be accountable for this sort of thing. Democracy, <laughs> another Mark Federman precious jewel, democracy is no more than expensive marketing. I'm sure you recognize this person uh, who may be the next president of the United States. Technological intervention can't unchange uninformed rants and advancing partisan interests that passes discourse these days. With enough money, Donald Trump's BS becomes presidential platform. With enough bandwidth, anyone with similar ignorance or arrogance can get the same amplifier. Mark is very down on all of this, and he will be followed here, I'm sure, by the next speaker, because there is a great deal to you know, criticize absolutely about how we are interconnected, but nevertheless, in the neo-instant feudalism of hashtags, retweets, followers, and celebrity cults, how do we envisage a social order where the, right, the rights of the individual are reconciled with those of the tribes, whatever they are in the long tail? Tribal federalism, global commons. Mark answers, when we figure out, and this is the key, when we figure out the intersection of local rights and participatory obligations among multiple social subnets, new smart democracy creates rules for active participation, policy creation, etc. Given the climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers, white supremacists, how smart can we be? Again, a great and important expression of doubt. I'll move on. I just want to show you this because I like it very much. London Living Labs. This is a tool. This is a, you know, it's a, a critical tool for civic participation. Uh, Gary says, on the other side of the technology wheel, data has empowered the citizen. Personal environmental sensor worn by citizen can disabuse information by authorities, as it has in Japan, around their nuclear reactor debacle. This is about the quality of air in London, and it's a, it's a very simple thing, an application you put on your uh, cell phone, and uh, you can photograph air pollution and see uh, how, you, on the, and you have an evaluation of how polluted it is. Here is a healthy on the right, and on the left you have the unhealthy, and, you know, you, you see these things, but you can't really make them, you can't make a proof out of them. In this case, you can, and you can actually claim there's more of the London Living Labs. A civic tool, um, smart citizen, go and see it, environmental sensor growth, which makes connected cities because it compares the various levels of different kind of parameters in different cities as an example of how you can put pressure on your government to improve your local situation. And this is the last one I'm going to show you. The Post City Kit should put, and this is by Jose Carlos Mariategui from Lima, Peru, professor at the University of Lima. The Post City Kit should, be, should put in evidence and with some rigor, and this is an indication where we're going, which are the current corporate technologies being implemented by governments and to some extent the initial consideration on them. The Post City Kit should address the issue of how we involve both the citizen individual data and the communities, communal data, in defining their interaction within public and private spaces at a local level and how that local level is connecting to a larger global digital data and infrastructure. It um, sounds like wishful thinking, but it's actually an indication of us, the future catalysts and the young innovators, uh, w w where do we think? We've got to be concrete with, with our proposal. Here's another example of transparency and I just wanted to show, we have a big migrant situation today. In this truck on the right, you can see the people that have been x-rayed that show, today we have this happening all the time. Now they're inventing this system to actually spot in places where you cannot find people uh, actually where they are. The migrant situation today is tragic, it really is. It's critical, but it's also an opportunity to think differently. How do you organize how you, I, I would love it to be one of the concerns of our Connected Intelligence Workshop. How do you deal with people 
How do you receive them? How do you reorganize this thing? How can, you, how can your economy handle it? These are all questions that are not answered yes. So my last word, it, what is the best of democracy? Individual freedom and an equilibrated participatory relationship between rulers and ruled. The ruler should be bound by responsibility. In the era of transparency, compensation is honor, not power. And that goes back to the old Greek aristocracy. The good people had power because they had honor, because they could be trusted. Uh, can we ever get back to this world with transparency? I don't know. It's something to think about. In any case, we'll be working on this, and I thank you for your attention.